First off, uh, welcome to the first uh, seminar of the year. It's going to be a great one. We all really appreciate you all being here in person. Um, it's great to have the uh, physical support um, in person, so thank you. Um, so, and again, I'm Jim Caswell, co-founder of Normandy Partners. Um, we are a full-service uh, commercial brokerage um, here in Atlanta, and um, uh, my partner and I, Nathan Williams, are excited to uh, have you today. Um, I do want to uh, quickly thank all of our sponsors uh, for the Education uh, Committee um, for all the support of the past year um, and, uh, and their continued support uh, in 2022. We will be uh, talking to you soon about uh, your continued support, so thank Please. you. Um, uh, I want to introduce the panel. We have an excellent panel today. Um, we have uh, Michael Howe, Lincoln Property Company, Kennedy Hicks. Uh, with Cousins, Tyler Courtney, with Cushman Wakefield, and Ryan Pennington from JLL. So incredible panel um, that's going to talk about the state of the office today. Um, you know, um, it was cold today, but Michael told me last night, he said, you know, just because it's cold doesn't mean we're not going to bring the heat today. So um, <laughs> look forward to a, uh, you like that? You like that? Like that. Um, uh, a great panel. So without any further ado, we're going to get started. But I do want to introduce um, the moderator, who's also my partner at Normandy. Um, Nathan Williams. So Nathan, take it over, bud. All righty. Thanks, Jim. Good crowd. This is great. Um, before we get started, I'm curious, by show of hands, who is, who's first time since COVID in person at one of these events? Would you, would you raise your hand if it's your first time since COVID? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good amount of people. That's really cool. Um, so the way this is going to work, we have a number of questions that we're going to ask this all-star panel. And um, everyone's just going to answer away. So why don't we go ahead and get started? We're talking about the office market. So the overall health of the office market. Big picture, everyone, how would you rate the overall health of the office market on a scale of 1 to 10 and why? 1 being awful, as bad as it can get. 10 being we've got no vacancy in Atlanta. Hard question. Bring me Hard heat. question. <laughs> How would you rate the overall health of the office market on a scale of 1 to 10 and why? Ladies first, right? Ladies first. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> go ahead, Kenny. Um, I'm, I'm going to say a 7.5 to an 8. I would say from, and this is Atlanta. Yeah. Um, you know, from a capital markets perspective, Atlanta has never been more in favor. And so just to see the type of investors that are looking at Atlanta that want to get in Atlanta. I mean, we have, you know, our peers on the public REIT side calling us trying to get educated on Atlanta. So I think that's that's a good thing. Um, it's hard to rate it much higher when there's not a lot of people going to the office. Um, so I think you've got to work through, you know, getting getting people back into the office. But just the, the sheer momentum that we're seeing from companies that have recognized Atlanta as a place where they want to be and hire um, talent is is awesome. And so I just I think there's a lot of good good things underway. And I think we'll see that continue um, this year. Yeah, I think I would agree a seven for me is where I fall. And if you look at our unemployment rate at 4.2%, you know, lower than the national average and a lot of other uh, states across the market, we've got a great talent pool. And I really think that's going to continue to draw net new users to the market and really help our um, kind of from a macro level, our economy grow. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um... I had a little calendar reminder pop up this week, and it was a three-year bet I made with Travis Jackson, and it just said, the office market will be in the toilet. And that bet was made in 29, January of 2019. Um, so if you think about it, there were some factors maybe working against the Atlanta office market that we felt building on the tenant side. There was a lot of delivery. There was a huge influx of co-working space, and we didn't have great visibility into how leased up that was. So there were plenty of people that had been watching this 10-year expansion kind of thinking, what's going to happen? Um, so I will say, sitting here right now, hearing a, you know, some pretty high numbers, I, I really think, given a global pandemic, we're doing pretty darn well. I would probably say a six, just because there are some sub-markets that I think are struggling more. But Atlanta has this great influx of talent. Uh, we have a highly educated, diverse workforce. And you, we, we've all read the newspaper headlines. There's just new announcements every week. So I feel really good about the state of the office market. I honestly don't know who's going to win that bet between me and Travis. We need a third-party arbiter. But um, 
Yeah. I, oh, I was on the, I was on the, it's not, you don't know Travis. No. <laughs> 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 I, I was on the, we're, we're going to be okay. Travis was in a doomsday scenario in January of 2019, which was pretty hard to do in January of 2019. There weren't a lot of things that weren't working. So uh, that, that's kind of where I am. You probably wouldn't have projected $60 gross rents. I year. certainly would not have projected $60 gross rents. Yeah, I'd say, I think as most people in this room know, as, as, as your deal flow goes, so goes your optimism. So I feel like one week I would be a, a five, and then the next week you're an eight and a half to a nine. Um, but I, I think back to the last time Atlanta had a big, you know, a big downturn, which was 08, 09. And I remember back then, um, if you think deal, deal velocity is slow right now, 08, 09, there was very little deals. There were one-year extensions. Capital, to Kennedy's point, Capital wanted nothing to do with Atlanta. It was a big red X on Atlanta, and that's not the case right now. You've got, you know, all these companies that, are, that want to be in Atlanta. Um, you've got, you know, multiple leases over a half million square feet getting signed, which is uh, rare territory for Atlanta. We're, we constantly get calls from Capital that want to know more about Atlanta because they want to invest in Atlanta. So um, I, I generally agree with the panel. Um, I'm probably a six and a half to seven, um, but... Uh, Personally, I'm very optimistic about where we're headed. Yeah, that's encouraging. Um, you know, you, I was looking at some reports this morning for this past quarter. Vacancies, to play devil's advocate, vacancies for the cities like 23%, sublease availability is as high as it's been in a long time. If someone's, you're talking about capital new to market to Atlanta, but if someone's not as familiar with what's going on in Atlanta and they look at the data, what would you tell them the data is not saying? One thing that jumps out for me is, is the shadow vacancy. Right. So Kennedy probably has some pretty good data on it. We try to track it through our property managers. It's hard to do it mid-spike, right? You know, who's in the office right now? Optimistically, 25%. Um, I, I think mid-Omicron, it's less than that, realistically. Uh, we have seen spikes where people are getting back in. But I think that's the big thing. It's, it's really hard to talk about the health of the office market when people aren't showing up in numbers. One thing I will say is that if you're looking, say we, we had a 25% number in early February, people are using the office differently, right? So on any given day, 25% could actually stretch out to numbers where you're seeing 60 to 70% of your office reestablishing kind of a, a, a footprint in the office. Um, and I think those numbers will continue to improve. I think we're going to have to start to reclass some of the, um, some of the buildings. Just as our market's grown and we've had this whole new inventory, uh, come online, and I don't know if everything that's considered Class A and is coming into that 22% vacancy is, is really should be considered Class A now. So I just think you've got to dig in a little bit more into how we're how we're looking at things. And there's been some large corporate, you know, occupied buildings that have been vacated that you know I would argue probably shouldn't be considered in the at the set at this point. That's um, that's a really interesting point. Um, not to put you on the spot, but what would you say? if you were to reclass some of the buildings between class maybe B plus that are being called class A and the true class A buildings, what would you say is the differentiator between the true class A buildings and maybe B plus, but they're listed as class A online? I mean, I think it has to do with, with location and amenities and yep. just the you know, way that they've been upgraded and maintained. And yep. so again, I think there's some of these big blocks of space that we've known were coming back for, for several years that are now affecting that, that it's going to take a lot of capital to get it into a place where that's something that you can, um, you know, consider to be back to Class A. Interesting. And I think from the tenant standpoint, we've really had a hard time educating our clients on just these general macroeconomic stats because there's, there's, there's such a gap between our different sub-markets. So we've really got to get into the weeds about the specific submarkets that our clients are interested in because there's such a huge delta between Midtown and the overall Class A average market stats for Atlanta. So from a tenant standpoint, there's a lot more education and specificity happening when we're talking with clients about the market. I'd say one thing we're watching, and this is not a, a positive necessarily, um, that the data is, isn't showing. If you, notwithstanding the new construction and the Beltline projects, um, while the rental rates have kind of plateaued or stayed level, we think the real story is that given where concessions are going, given the cost of build-outs and TIs creeping up, the net effective rates are, are down um, for the most part throughout our portfolio. And it's not really getting talked about, um, but our, our clients, our landlords are feeling, 
feeling that pain of, um, you know, if you kind of just run a net effective of where we were today versus pre-COVID, it's, it's down 10, 15 percent. Interesting. Um, Ryan, what you said is a great segue into our next point, tenant decision making. I think we all kind of live in that world, some of us on the landlord side, some of us on the tenant side. What would you say are some major change in criteria over the past year? What, what factors are going into tenants that are making decision right, decisions right now? Maybe what are some new trends you've seen over the past two years that you might not have seen before? Yeah, so I'll take this kind of in kind of two parts. I'll talk about um, the first really decision making within our clients' organizations themselves. So this has become um, really challenging for our, our tenants and their decision making internally has expanded to now include a lot more players within the C-suite, the real estate team, and then quite frankly, local constituents at all levels. So now our clients are having um, a more challenge creating this buyer confidence. And so that's, that's one thing. They either also have too much data or not enough data to feel like they can make that confident decision. So you have more, way more people that you're trying to figure out how to come to consensus and then um, that buyer confidence. So I think that's a big trend that we're all seeing and having to navigate through. And then externally, when we're on tours and having our clients talk about what they want out of real estate, it's now changed from this amenity-based conversation and purely location conversation and more around how in the world are we gonna create an experience that will draw our employees out of their homes and apartments and condos into the office. And it's not necessarily to come sit and do work, it's to connect with their organization, meet their, um, their colleagues, grow their uh, internal, you know, organization in whatever way that they need to, but it's not really to do heads down work. So I think that's a huge shift that we're seeing is what does that mean? What does that experience mean? And it's, it's not just happening in the four walls of their office or a building. It is to Kennedy's point, the area, the surrounding area and, and what is that experience um, for each user? Yeah, and these guys are probably closer to the actual tenant decision-making process, but I'll put my Cushman Wakefield as a tenant hat on for a second. And it, part of my role is to try to get people back into the office, uh, but not only be there, be excited about kind of the product that we're delivering. So one surprising hang-up has been parking. It's, it's not terribly sexy, it's, um, but it is something where you see a lot of tenant frustration, I think, given, you know, low parking allocations through most of our CBD. We have more people that we may be mapping to smaller spaces. And we have a, you know, kind of parking structure that feels outdated to me, right? So if we have one and a half per thousand parking and five per thousand employees, I need to find a way to get those five per thousand employees into the office. So what happens if you're someone who's coming in two days a week and you were used to paying monthly parking, you shut your monthly parking off, and now, you know, the incremental, the, the daily rate, something like if I show up seven or eight times a, a month, it's the same as my monthly parking. That becomes this just daily consistent barrier that a lot of our employees are, are having. And so but there's some technology out there that I think is really promising that I think could be one of the lasting impacts of COVID is allowing <coughs> tenants to really find a way to utilize those assets, those one and a half per thousand, four per thousand, whatever it might be. Uh, parking allocation in a way that really allows their employees the flexibility and it would be very hard for me to advise a tenant making a long-term decision to do you know to enter into that agreement without having a whole lot more flexibility around how their people get there yeah to, to piggyback off ryan your second comment um pre-covid we always heard you know recruit and retain that's what em employers wanted to do with their employees and what we're hearing and seeing a lot more now is recruit, retain, but also return. How do, you, how do these employers get their employees back into the office? And I think it's incumbent on these landlords to, um, to help with that, to recognize you know, what those desires and needs are of these employers, whether it's you know, outdoor spaces, um, just, just various um, you know, amenities around the building. But we've got to help these employers get their employees back in the building because that ultimately benefits all of us. Um, so that's, that's one thing that we continue to hear on, on tours and talking with decision makers. Yeah. Help, help me help you, in other words. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think it, I mean, make it better than home. Like, it just yeah. 
create, you know, get people back back in and, and create some of the same conveniences that they've gotten accustomed to over the past two years. Um, and I and I think there's other, you know, I, a lot of it's just the amenities and having you know, some of the the ability for people to come together and be in an exciting environment. But I, I mean, I, I totally hear you on the parking thing. I think that's going to be a big thing this year is just reworking the economic structure so that it works for both landlords and tenants um, because there is going to be just, you know, a different cadence in which people are coming in. Yes, Judy. Yeah, as um, Michael and Tony as owners, because this is a parking is always an issue as an owner of a business or tenant. And I've always thought that part of the problem with the parking is that, and I'm going to have to keep this answer, is that landlords are allowing all their people to park in there. And it seems to me that a solution to some of that would be we're going to allow this many reserved parking. It's, it's free and reserved get a reserved spot, there might be 30 spaces and it actually flows and I'm curious if there's been discussion with landlords for this to start rolling out for all 50 spots. I knew that was coming too. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to be careful at who's in here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we, we have not, we haven't specifically talked about the reserved piece, but, but to Tyler's point, there is technology now and we've got it in some of our buildings where um, and this is also a slippery slope for landlords, the technology to if, if you've got four per thousand and you've got half your staff works two days a week and the other half works three days a week to where you can have a shared card and the system knows, keeps count, and knows who's coming and going so that you don't, you don't over park your allotment. And now how that pricing structure works is, is still TBD, but that technology exists now and I think you're going to see that installed in more and more buildings and decks to allow that flexibility. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a variety of things and probably going to be in a bit of an experimentation period here. Um, but at our, our new project that we've planned in Midtown, we've got a, a club level of parking. And so you pay a specific rate to get access to that level, but then there's not a designated space within that. Um, and then, you know, 725 Ponds, just given sort of the nature of that um, customer base, you know, we're, we're playing with different pricing for daily rates and um, just ways that you can again make it work for both the both the customer and the landlord. I know we're all tired of hearing it and talking about it, but it's hard to talk about tenant decision making without three words: work from home. What are you guys hearing? What are y'all seeing um, across your portfolios? Tenants you're talking to with tenants you're talking to in your buildings. Um, how many folks? It might be easier for you, the landlords to answer this, but how many folks are back in the office on a percentage standpoint and? Um, with some of your tenants that are still working from home, are you hearing that you know, they are planning to come back or is that working and they want to go, go that way? I know everyone's different, but um, just speak to work from home in general. I haven't, I haven't heard that term, work from home. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you work from your house? We'll talk about it later, yeah. <laughs> um, we're, you know, our portfolio in Atlanta, which is uh, on the office side, uh, 11, 12 million square feet, we're, we're kind of hovering around 35% physical occupancy. and. In the suburbs, that number's maybe a little bit closer to 40, and in town, maybe it's a little bit closer to 25. Um, I, you know, I think we've all kind of waxed poetic on work from home. Um, my, my personal opinion is that I think you can run a business from home. I don't. I would argue that you can't grow a business and and, and cultivate a business from from home. And um, I think it's going to be interesting to see these companies that have already said we're work from home forever. It'll be interesting to see if that lasts. Um, but I think I think the office environment looks different. There's certainly going to be more flexibility, and um, but I think that, and I won't I won't put a timeline on it. I think you see the majority of people in some way, shape, or form back in the office. You know, um, certainly before the next three to five years. I mean, look, I think the tech companies are a great example. Like, they're they're struggling to hire and to retain talent. And it's a competition, and they've got to, you know, make sure they're, they're not doing anything that's different from the other tech companies that are that are out there competing for the same talent base. But then you look around, and, like, in Austin, Facebook just signed a 600,000-square-foot lease. And yet they're telling the employee, like, we don't know when we're going to get back to the office. Yeah. Well, clearly somebody knows something right. because they're willing to make this commitment. Um, same with Amazon. Same with Google. I mean, they're just, you know, acquired a billion dollar property in London. So it's like they're, they're clearly, I think, focused on a long term, you know, office bias. There's going to be more flexibility, I think. I mean, I don't, it's going to be hard. The longer this goes on, I think the harder it is to kind of, you know, revert back so quickly. Um, but I do think 
from our perspective, most of our customers are planning on coming back to the office, you know, either half the time, the majority of the time, and they're, and they're willing to make that commitment from a lease standpoint. The only ones I'd say you've seen, I mean, obviously a lot of the big insurance companies, you know, more of a call center type jobs have been um, more willing to give up space, but the companies that are in, in growth mode and looking to um, really, you know, continue to <laughs> evolve as not working and their dog is barking in the background. Child. It's, it's terrible. It's awful. Sorry. <laughs> Digress. Yeah, I, I think on the work from home front, it's, it's kind of incumbent upon employers to put a good product out there for their employees. And I think we like to think of the return to office as this kind of magical thing where we're back and we're, you know, everyone's excited to be there. We're humming at full occupancy. And that's just not it. That's not the reality. So I think we have to find ways to improve that office experience. Um, you know, some of it is free food and, you know, the, the, the little amenities that we kind of associate with tech companies. It is amazing what people will do for free Chick-fil-A, but ultimately, you know, I think people want to be around smart people, energetic people. They want to, you know, collaborate. And, and for our young people in particular, I think there's so much training and development that happens sitting next to someone. So I guess if I had one piece of advice to our tenants that are going back and kind of experiencing that, it's, it's try to concentrate, right? If, if for any of us that have had to sublease space, getting rid of, you know, 40% excess space can do amazing things for just the feeling in the office. So whether you have to do that, everyone's coming in. I heard someone recently, it's Wednesday through Friday. Those are their days in the office and just concentrating back in because if you show up in the office and it's nothing like you remember it, you're not going to want to come back. So just trying to find ways to really improve the, the employee experience while they're there. Yeah. I think the only other thing I would add is just from a tenant perspective, you know, work from home is a very broad term. And we're seeing uh, within our client base, it's a one size fits one. And I don't mean that just from the organizations. I mean from each employee. So we've got clients who have five to six work styles, we'll call them. Hybrid home, hybrid office, hybrid hybrid. I mean, the names are just, the acronyms are getting really convoluted and extensive and the programs are changing significantly. So we do think that it is having an effect on real estate overall, that these work styles are gonna decrease the footprint from one standpoint. But on the other hand, because of these variable work styles and the need for collaboration space, we're seeing square footage increase kind of on the back end. So it's just a little interesting the, the true impact of these different work styles and work from home from our tenant perspective. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Jim and I were doing a, a small renewal in one of our buildings in Alpharetta recently. And similar to what you said, Tyler, he, I was talking to the decision maker and he said that, you know, he needed a little bit more TI to spruce up some things in the space because he was trying to incentivize his people back. But then he said to me, he's like, I'm, I'm worried that all of my employees have second or third jobs right now. I have to get them back to the office. Um, I appreciated his candor and his honesty, but I feel like there are more people out there that actually feel that way as well. So um, we'll move on to, to just the world of COVID. Um, we don't have to spend a ton of time here. I'm sure we're all talk, uh, tired of talking about this. But in y'all's opinion, what are some of the lasting effects of COVID? You know, is it, is it really going to uh, impact the way tenants make decisions long term or is it just a blur, and once this goes away, everyone's going to go back to the way they made decisions a um, long time ago? So bold speculation and courage, please. Go ahead. All right, I'll start. All right. Um, you know, I'm not sure if this is a trend that will continue, but I hope it does. I work with a lot of kind of companies that we consider corporate America, okay, corporate users, people that moved at the pace of the Titanic. And here we have COVID, and in an instant, they had to change dramatically the way they did everything. And it, I think, freed up a lot of these large corporations to stop for a second and think, we don't have to move that slow. We can make bold, nimble decisions about our people, about our business. And I hope that really continues to accelerate and change for a lot of our corporate partners. We'd all love to see that. That would be great. <laughs> um, so I, I think one lasting impact I would see coming out of COVID, typically we think of, you know, the, the real estate allocation. If you're a CFO, the dollars we're spending on our physical footprint as really being allocated to real estate. I, I think um, those funds are going to be competed for with a broader bucket of, of um, 
of other interests. So I think about training um, as, as one thing where people might start borrowing from their real estate bucket to do things that, that really help with, with their employee training, with their, with their culture. That could be team retreats, off-sites, I think just anything that kind of improves the ability um, or, or, or the um, interest in employees working for that company. And so uh, that, that'll be interesting to me just to see how that plays out. I mean, if, if, if you think about reducing your square footage a bit and kind of earmarking those dollars for, you know, training and development and, and fun trips, right? I heard about someone taking all their employees down to the Bahamas. Hard to argue with. I, I, I don't think, um, you know, one trip a year to the Bahamas is, uh, is, is culture, but I do think that it, it could play a role in, in, in a pretty big thing, kind of making up for lost time and reconnecting employees. So I just think it'll be interesting to see how people are thinking about their real estate dollars. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Ray, and it's given everybody a chance to think about office space, like whether you just go there as a you know employee or if you're in HR or if you're in um, the C-suite. So I think it's, it's definitely shine a light on that. But I, I tend to think we're going to revert back to kind of typical human behavior and as the momentum will set in and as more people start to come back, people are going to realize, well, I guess I need to get to the office if I want to be be seen and, and be a part of this company. And again, maybe it's not five days a week, but it's it's with some regularity. And, um, you know, a lot of these things that have happened were happening already. And so this just helped accelerate it in terms of just a focus on amenities and, and catering to the employees and making it somewhere where they want to come. Um, so I, I tend to think it's not going to look dramatically different in, in a few years. Uh, I, I think one thing that's that COVID has accelerated that will be here to stay is the tech, is how we utilize technology in real estate. I think we're generally slow, real estate people are slow to adapt to technology. Patrick Braswell would disagree if, if he were here. Um, but you know whether it's uh, you know prop tech was already starting to you, you saw prop tech picking up before COVID, um, but we're really seeing it all over the place now. Whether it's you know software that that analyzes how you, you know, space utilization and when people are coming and going from certain uh, points in the building so you can track you know people's movement and say maybe we need to move our amenity area over here because all the tenants walk in this area whether it's energy management systems and and at you know at my level marketing right I mean we had some property videos before COVID and some you know digital stuff but now it, you know if it's not if that's not in your you know your repertoire if you don't have Matterports and VR tours so that a real estate director in Chicago can preview your space I think you're I think you're behind the times. And so it's really accelerated and kind of stepped up our game uh, from a marketing standpoint, too. That's great. Um, let's, let's dive into Atlanta as a city for a little bit. Um, on the investor side and on the tenant side, why would you guys say, what would you guys say it is about Atlanta that is attractive to people? What's attractive to investors? Um, what, what is it about Atlanta that's attractive to investors, and what is it about Atlanta to tenants that's attractive for them to move their business here? And, you know, there's certainly a couple key things that everyone's aware of, but second part of that question, what would you say is one of the more underrated things about Atlanta and why people choose to come here? You're the investor. <laughs> um, I mean, look, I think, yeah, Atlanta's certainly gotten attention of the, of the world in the past um, couple of years. I think there was, again, a lot of things already underway that were – were helpful to our, our city, but um, you start to get announcements like Microsoft made and, and everyone starts to pay attention and say, well, what's going on here? I think the, um, the university system that we have here and the, the growth and enrollment that they've experienced and continue to experience and the diversity of, of students and talent is huge for, for companies that are looking to come to Atlanta. Um, and so investors are, investors are taking note of that. And, and I think, you know, there's a little bit of migration out of the, the big gateway cities too. So when people are looking to where they want to invest, um, you know, certainly uh, Atlanta and other Sunbelt markets are offering a lot of, a lot of growth potential. Um, the relative cost is still, still feels good um, to think about you know, where our rates are um, relative to, to gateway cities. There's still some room there. So I think um, you know, there, there's a lot to like, and I think the momentum of you know, a lot of this other companies are watching what other companies are doing and, and want to be a part of that. And so you're seeing that play out with some of the recent job announcements and, and people wanting to, to get in and, and make sure they're not missing out on, on what's happening here. 
Yeah, I, I think we all know kind of a lot of the factors that make Atlanta great, and you hit on a lot of them. I, I think if I had a little bit of a wish list for the office market, the very top of that would be a more robust life sciences you know, business. Um, that's something that I've heard as I'm speaking to my peers in other in other cities that, that manage markets and a massive tailwind that they've had in Raleigh, Durham, and Boston, and San Diego that is driving just a ton of demand. So life science has been absolutely so hot. I think, you know, really promising um, fundamentals in Georgia that can drive that over the next over the next ten years. Um, but currently, we really don't have those the, the orange a significant concentration of R and D. We don't have the lab space or the corridors that you see in New Jersey. Um, so. That could really be, you know, we think about Atlanta having a ton of tailwinds. That's actually one kind of untapped demand driver that I hope that we can unlock. I think what the Metro Atlanta Chamber is doing, um, that is, that, that, that's one of your declared vertical, Greg, de declared verticals, Greg, where I really see a bright future in Atlanta with the CDC and Georgia Tech and just all the things that there, there have been some nice announcements lately, but we've got a long way to go. I think from the tenant standpoint, you know, every time we have a new company kind of coming to Atlanta and wants the short list of Atlanta, Dallas, Austin, Raleigh, Charlotte, it comes down to the talent is what we're hearing. So it's not just the new talent coming out of our robust university systems, but the connectivity and opportunity to help grow the HBCUs and really start creating uh, an additional layer of talent, really educated talent with lots of opportunities that maybe doesn't exist today. Um, so it's opportunistic talent. And then it is um, existing talent within our diversified businesses. You know, we're really diverse, notwithstanding life sciences sector, <laughs> um, but we're pretty diverse uh, from an industry standpoint. So there's lots of labor and really skilled labor um, that's been in the talent pool for a while that our clients are attracted to. Um, Submarket specific, what, what would you guys say is the hottest submarkets right now? Um, I think we all know what is the hottest submarket right now in Midtown. It has been and will continue to be probably for a little bit longer. But maybe outside of that, what are you seeing um, other parts of Atlanta? What is hot and why would you say that is? Well, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. I think, uh, and, and by that I mean, We've, we've got two projects in a similar submarket, and one of them could be, you know, extremely busy and active, and the other one is, is completely dead. And I think some of that is um, just bad luck due, due to COVID. You know, you, you could have a building where you're on the receiving end of a consolidation, or you could be on, on the wrong end of a consolidation. Um, but I also think there's a flight to quality, um, whether that's, you know, suburban product or if you're in town. Within the submarket, we're definitely seeing a flight to quality. So I... I think it's I think it's more nuanced than just which submarkets are um, are outperforming others. But but to your point, Midtown clearly, um, if you look at the latest, you know, before COVID, and you look at the latest numbers um, from fourth quarter of this year, they're they're the leader of the pack. But I, I think West Midtown, and this isn't anything n nobody in this room doesn't know, but West Midtown um, is I think you know going to be the bell of the ball here for the next 12, 18 months. The amount of activity and interest we're seeing. The new uh, Westside Beltline connector that runs from the new Quarry Park down in Mercedes Benz. Um, we're just seeing a lot of, of interest in uh, in that area, and obviously Microsoft and Georgia Tech are huge huge drivers on that Westside. That's great. I guess I'll make an observation that's kind of been a little bit of a head scratcher for me, and uh, we all know the strength of Midtown. We get to sit in, in our office every day in the core of Midtown at 14th and Peachtree. I've been a little bit surprised in the market by the lack of really value-driven tenants. You know, typically when you see really large price differentials between Class A products in, in a midtown and a downtown, um, you'd see more of that spillover demand, right? You'd see tenants getting priced out of midtown. You'd see them looking at adjacent submarkets. I'm not seeing that nearly at the rate I would have expected. And I think, you know, downtown long-term, I'm, I'm very bullish on had a lot of things kind of turn against downtown at, at once. You've got the concentrations of government. You've got a lot of conferences and events. Uh, you have a lot of students. And so, on, and, and you have uh, public transportation. So I think those things kind of are, are real positive things that turned a little bit negative during COVID. And so, and, and you just see the excitement of some of the projects with Centennial Yards and what they're talking about at Underground. 
there's a ton of potential there. I just think that for, for whatever reason, tenants, it's, it's, I think it goes to that flight to quality, the competitiveness of the hiring environment. You're really not seeing people say, we're not going to go for the $40 space, we're going to go for the $25 space. You're seeing people say, we're going to take 20% less square footage and we're going to the nicest building. Yeah, if you're coming here to hire talent, you're not worried about the last couple of dollars of rent. You're worried about being in the right place and the right um, environment to, to grow. So I, I, I agree with what both of you said. I mean, flight to quality, I think, is, is real. I think there's a bifurcation in all the submarkets. Midtown's awesome, but I'm not sure that's been to the detriment of other submarkets necessarily. There's still a lot of good things that are happening um, in other submarkets, and I think that's what, you know, that's an appeal of Atlanta, that there's, there's options for companies that are coming here, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, but certainly Midtown, just with the growth that it's had and the new product and the, um, the coolness of that product, both in core of Midtown and the east side and the west side, um, is great, and it's, it's a great thing for new companies that are coming to look here. But um, I do think there's, there's a lot of other pockets and, and other projects that can create that same environment that will, will do well. I think when I first started, you know, 10 years ago, maybe a little more at this point, Tenants were looking at a singular submarket, or maybe one or two submarkets, and it was so focused on we should be in this submarket because of X, Y, or Z. Now our clients are really less focused on submarkets and more focused on where is the right building with the right amenity set creating, we've already said it, right, the right experience, and it's spanning multiple submarkets. As those organizations continue to grow and as Atlanta continues to grow, people live everywhere. When you really take into account all your different employees and where you think you're going to recruit people at every level, it's from Alpharetta where they're living. It's from the Northwest Market. It's from Midtown. You know, Unless you're kind of 27 and under, we're not really seeing um, people say our center of gravity is in the middle of Midtown so we can only look here. Um, so it's, I think, in recent conversations with landlords, like, well, wait, you're not just looking in Midtown. My competition isn't just across the street. It's a big block of space or down the road. It's in a completely different submarket. We're having to just shift the way that we're thinking about our competition and competing a, a West Midtown property or an East Midtown property with the Battery or with Avalon. That's great. I think one of the the big things that was mentioned a lot, and I haven't heard it quite as much within the past year, but maybe right when COVID started was the flight to suburbs. Are you guys seeing that um, in your portfolio at all? We don't have to spend a ton of time there, but I'm sure some of us are curious in the room if that is a trend we're seeing. I, I, I think we saw that early on for sure. Um, we've got a big project in Alpharetta Northwinds, and, and it's hard to say if that skewed our beliefs on that or um, if there really was more activity in the suburbs, but we felt that, and I would tell you that I think as the city of Atlanta has opened up a little bit more um, and people are in the urban environment are getting back in the office, it feels like the it's, it's shifted back to where it's pretty equal in our portfolio. I think a few of the, um, the kind of myths or things we thought we knew early on drove a lot of that suburban demand or that flight to the suburbs, I guess I would more accurately call it. Um, there was a Deloitte study that came out that said we all may be in a building like 1180 Peachtree, a 40-story high-rise. We might be waiting in line for an hour and a half to get on the elevator. Uh, that certainly hasn't happened. I've had a couple people ride the elevator with me. Uh, but we're not, um, not everyone's showing up at 8.30. Not everybody's leaving at 5. You know, there's, there's just more distribution about how people are using the space that have alleviated some of those concerns. We also haven't had a major health incident in the building, right? We've had had cases. We have, you know, over a thousand people that work in that building. We have not had uh, half the building go down, right? So some of the things that I think people were really worried about in concentrating people to that extent indoors really have kind of come and gone. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, one other quick thing that's, that's interesting, and this is anecdotal, um, but a lot of people moved to Atlanta during COVID. I mean, we, and we've got with, with the Norfolk Southerns and the Microsoft, I mean, people are moving into Atlanta and you haven't really felt it on the roads because people are working from home. And I think there was a, there was a lot of talk early on about, God, traffic's gonna be terrible when, when people start getting back to the office. And in fairness, everybody's not back in the office yet. But I think what's, what's interesting, Tyler, you mentioned coming in at different times. I think that's gonna be, it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. I don't think everybody's gonna come in at 8 a.m. and leave at 5.30 p.m. It's gonna fluctuate throughout the day. And, 
So I, I say that is just I think it's going to be interesting to watch um, how Atlanta is from a traffic standpoint. Interesting. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, and then we'll we'll go to Q and A. Um, advice: uh, a bunch of tenured professionals up here with lots of experience. How are you advising? Um, younger people that maybe just got into the industry a year or two ago or are thinking about getting into commercial real estate. It's different times now than it was maybe three or four years ago when everything was great and everyone wanted to do commercial real estate. What, what, are, you, what are you saying? How are you coaching younger folks to, to push through these challenging times or, or what are you saying to folks who are looking to get in the industry right now? Find an industrial job? <laughs> <laughs> or multifamily. <laughs> um. No, I'm just kidding. I love all this. But um, I think I think there is a little bit of, yeah, people get, I've had a lot of people recently, like, really want to pinpoint, like, a product type or something. I'm like, I don't know if it really matters. Like, I think just get in with people that are, that are you know, doing deals and that will, you know, let you come around, along on tours and, and just kind of get out there. And then they'll naturally fall into a certain product type or a certain um, role. But um, so I would say just don't ever think it from that standpoint. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I look out in the room. We've got a lot of tenure in the room. It's really impressive like to look out here and think about the deals that each of you have worked on and the clients that you have. Um, it's amazing. And it just means that we have such an amazing depth of experience for not necessarily. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Ryan just called y'all old. No, no. Experience. Experience. But it's great to have opportunity for not mentorship, but apprenticeship, right? Our business is really based on apprenticeship, getting to walk alongside projects and see how it's done from the best and the brightest. And so as a young, as a young broker, I would be doing, I still am doing it today, everything I can to sit alongside somebody who's more experienced than I am so I can learn and grow. I think for young people we have today, and there is actually a surprising kind of lack of young people, and I, I, I hope that's not already the product of kind of the environment we're in. I've not seen a big flight out of office brokerage since this started. I've seen a couple of people kind of make career changes, but you know, disruptive events like this are going to have a, a thinning process, but um, there, there's a ton of opportunity that comes out on the other side of that. So, you know, our, our youngest people that are doing the best are the ones that are coming in the office, and they are walking side, you know, hand, hand in hand with, with their senior brokers, and they're just, you know, they're a sponge. But it's, um, I, I, I get a lot of resumes, I get a lot of phone calls, and I think it used to be a lot of people that want to get into office brokerage. Um, now I am seeing a lot more diversity. The, 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 uh, the strength of multi and industrial is rippling to the schools and the graduates, so it's a little bit more diversified. Nine out of ten resumes I used to get wanted to be in, in office brokerage in, in one form or another. And um, I would say, you know, now it's two or three. Um, so for those people, I'm just saying be really, really persistent. Um, you know, do a lot. Ha meet with as many people as you can. It is a really frustrating. Everyone probably remembers their experience getting into the business. But it can be a really frustrating path. So, you know, just a lot of persistence that will serve them well when they make it. Yeah, my, my advice, which I don't know if it's any good or not, but um, I, I tell people that our business isn't easy, but it's it's also it's relatively simple, right? I think if you work hard, if you do what you say you're going to do, and you respect respect people well, you, you may I'm not that doesn't guarantee you that you're the top one percent, but you can make a living, good living in this business and be in this business for a long time. So that's that's kind of my advice to younger folks. Yeah. I think it's kind of easy to stay behind a computer too, right? So it's important as Things start opening up for people to just get back out, get walk, walk the real estate, go see what's happened over the last um, couple of years. Last advice question: what are, what are some guiding principles or maybe intangible skill sets that you guys felt like have have helped you throughout your career, and that you're telling younger people as well? You know what it takes to make it in this industry. I don't know. I, I think a little bit about the last recession, and it is amazing that you actually found four people that I think survived, you know, the downturn because it, yeah. it really cleaned out our, you know, our generation of brokers in a in a big way. Um, you know, in in May of two thousand nine, I was on my honeymoon, and my company went out of business. GVA Advantage just closed their doors. Um, I, 
gotten email from HR saying management's gone dark and they didn't pay health insurance this month. Good luck. <laughs> and uh, that that that's like a scar, I guess I carry with me, right? And I was fortunate. I you know bumped into a couple people that uh, pretty quickly gave me some opportunities. But I, I do think there's probably some common characteristics of all of that that kind of made it through that that event at a young age. <laughs> it's been hard for me to shake. I, I think. I have a little bit of paranoia around what is, what's the next bomb that's going to go off. It's not normal to see a ten-year kind of un, uh, you know, unabated uh, expansion. So um, it's just kind of left me with this feeling of, of uneasiness around any market that's too strong for too long. So, you know, we have a lot of younger people that have been in the business. I mean, you could be in the business for ten years in industrial and have never really seen a dip um, on the office side. I'd say this one counts for our young office brokers, but um, it, it's just a defining characteristic that I think will, will stay with them. Yeah, I think, I mean, humility, right? To your point about there's, there will come a downturn, and uh, I think it's easy to get in this business, and especially in a rising market, and you have a great year, or you see these guys that are, you know, doing all kinds of mega deals, and you think that, you know, that's, it's, it's written in stone for you, and that's just, it's not the case. I think you've got to, Stay humble and, uh, and weather the ups and downs. I think in a commission-only business like we're in, it's really easy to focus on yourself and your business and your revenue. And I have learned probably equally as much um, that helps my clients and help myself by giving back to others and leading within the community, within JLL, within our real estate group. So. I think that intangible is pulling out of yourself and doing something for other people. You're going to learn a lot and learn a lot of leadership skills that will really help and grow your business. That that is amazing, and I just I'm just thinking, going a little bit further internally. You mentioned JLL, but the people who can really um, collaborate really well across service lines, right? This is not a this is not a lone wolf sport anymore. Our our tenants are asking for things that are really complicated, so you've got to be really good at partnering with other people and understanding the consulting side, the labor side, the project management side, and all that just comes with collaboration. Uh, that might not be a skill of, of every broker who, you know, is, is kind of in it as a, for, for themselves. Be willing to adapt and accept change and figure out, you know, how to, it is, it is interesting. It was a very good experience. I think at my point, at the point in my career, is to learn that not all deals that come to market close, you know, in 2007 <laughs> and eight, and so, um, or 2008, really, but um, so I think it's it's good to have these times where you get to reflect a little bit on on what's going on and what's what's going to um, you know matter on the other side, and, and that makes us all better at investing and understanding kind of what what the market can bring. That's awesome. Um, we've got a couple more minutes, so I want to open up uh, some Q and A time. So raise your hand if you have a question. We'll bring you the mic. Um, so you asked Dan, just compare just House Cumberland comparing to Central Perimeter. Was that the first part of the question? Um, we've we probably got a little more product in Central Perimeter right now than than Cumberland, but um, I would tell you that uh, activity's been pretty good in Cumberland. Um, I think Central Perimeter had, you know, there's some tailwinds pre-COVID between State Farm giving some space back, and then obviously IHG now has put 300,000 square feet in the subways market. Um, so I think in spite of that, there's still been some, some significant transactions that have happened in the last year or two, but it's a, it's a big submarket, and, um, you know, personally, we have seen, I think that submarket's a little bit bifurcated between the 285 Ashford Dunwoody exit and the, um, uh, 400 corridor, and, um, we have seen a little more activity in the 400 corridor of that submarket than 285 Ashford Dunwoody, but I don't, I don't have any real reason that's driving that. And then up in Kennesaw... Um, you know, that's a, it's, that's been interesting. It's a historically pretty tight market, single digit vacancy for a really long time. Um, client of ours delivered a, a spec building, you know, um, TPA built the Edison, um, 
delivered into the teeth of COVID. Uh, and the, the whole Kennesaw, the town center area, Cobb County, was, they were thrilled with it because there hadn't been a new office building in Kennesaw in 14 years. And they had trouble attracting big users to that submarket because there wasn't enough space. There was, had trouble growing existing tenants in that submarket. Um, and we were fortunate um, to, to land a deal for the whole building with a, with a group that was already in Marietta, but they expanded in a massive way. And they were considering um, other parts of Atlanta, uh, other states, neighboring states for their requirement. And had that building not been in Kennesaw, they, they at a minimum would have left Marietta and potentially Georgia. So um, I think long term, that's the market, the, roof, the amount of rooftops up there, the demographics, it's a very sticky tenant base. Um, we're believers in Kennesaw long term, but it's, it's a smaller micro market, obviously. Any more questions? Please raise your hand. Take this guy right behind you, beat you to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can hear you. I press the button. It might be off. So uh, we've heard talk about uh, Buckhead potentially uh, leaving uh, the city of Atlanta and becoming its own city. Um, from you all's uh, perspective, what do you think a uh, change like that? How could it impact the state of the Atlanta market? <laughs> I have pretty strong feelings here. I, I, I first and foremost don't think it's going to happen. Um, I don't want it to happen. I think it would be wildly disruptive, not only for you know, the city of Atlanta, but the city of Buckhead. Um, it, it would, th there's just a lot of data that really hasn't fully come to the surface. And I, I think a lot of people are looking at that as an answer to a problem that is convenient, and when, when really the issues are kind of much deeper seated than that. And so, I don't know. I, I, I love seeing our, our new mayor get sworn in. I think we're kind of on a path to really strong, you know, governor mayor of Atlanta relations, uh, which for, for those of us around for Kasim and Beal, that was a that was a wonderful thing for our city having, having that. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if, if you look around at kind of who's supporting either side of that, I think the real estate communities largely come behind, you know, the anti city of Buckhead movement and. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of depth to the support of remaining united. I, I think we live in an amazing city, and the problem is that noise could, you know, uh, send send some um, some tenants looking at, at our competitor markets in the southeast. I think so. I hope we can kind of move past that quickly. Yeah, I think the noise distracts us from attacking real problems and things that you know, have have gone on over the past couple of years, happening in other cities as well. But um, it is in my view, important that we, we stay united and allow for the new mayor to get in and have a chance to, to do his job. And, um, and I'm not sure that there's a, enough of a plan for, for Buckhead that, that would accomplish solving some of the challenges. Yeah, I mean, real estate aside, it's a terrible idea. Um, and I just would encourage people um, to just lean in and get kind of get educated on the issues. The, the APS, I mean, it's a big deal fact that the, the tax increase the rest of the city would feel if Buckhead spun off on its own. Um, there's just so many problems that haven't been tackled. They're, they're, it's a fear-based concept that crime will go away if we do this, and I just I, I, don't, I don't think that's the answer. Um, but, but putting the real estate hat on is an even worse idea. Um, I think it'd be, I think it'd be terrible for not just Buckhead, but for all of Metro Atlanta. I think we're generally you know seen as a, um, a city that's open for business and um, and that's evidenced by you know a lot of the work that Greg and his team have done bringing companies to Atlanta, and I think that's a that's a major step backwards if if Buckhead were to spin off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think we got time for one more quick question. Feel free, go ahead. Do you think the uh, concept of hoteling of office space will be permanent? It's been prevalent in the uh, accounting industry for some years, uh, or is it that just a fad? I take this one from a tenant perspective. <laughs> um, yeah, it's here to stay. So I think it has a lot of different names from hoteling to hot desks to work styles. But I think the, um, at least right now, the pendulum is swinging more towards not every single person needs a dedicated desk to sit in on a dedicated floor every single day. Um, so 
it'll vary. You know, there's a variance depending on your industry and how often your people are in the office. But for the most part, uh, I think it's here to stay. I completely agree with that. I, you know, there are so many people who are only going to use the office two or three days a week. We, we, we can't have dedicated space for everybody. So you know, just utilizing that asset that we have that is our office efficiently, it just won't allow for kind of one desk, one person going forward. Certain businesses will. Go ahead, Chris. If money wasn't an object, what creative amenities would you like to see incorporated into buildings? Hmm. When I sit in my building, which is beautiful, thank you, cousin, um, but <laughs> there's not an opportunity to have immediate fresh air to clear my mind and within five minutes transform my thinking from one topic and moving to another. And I think the easiest amenity that is free to everyone is fresh air and light. So if there is an opportunity to be able to bring that in to office buildings, price is not an issue, to create an outdoor patio, um, things like that, I think it'd be great. Yeah, I think you, you guys just did that down on Spring Street, right? I mean, the, it'll be interesting to see how that gets utilized, but I, I, I think that's a great answer. Do people want to be outdoors? No got to solve for wind and certain things that make that uh, uh, actually realistic. But I hope that you see the demand just flooding to that outdoor space you have um, that, you know, kind of cements that space. Because I do think Lawrence Gellerstadt put something out a while ago that talked about, um, you know, people not just looking at the rentable square feet, but kind of their <laughs> outdoor square feet as available. Because I do think particularly the younger companies, the tech companies, it's, it's just, it's a way of working that people want. Yeah, I think, I think pre-COVID, the demand was fitness centers and bigger conference centers, and, and obviously that's, that's changed. But I, I totally agree, outdoor, outdoor areas, that's what we hear more often than not. And quick, shameless plug for Echo Street West. Um, <laughs> but we've got a development that deli will deliver next May in, uh, called Echo Street West on the west side off the connector. And Chris, we've got almost 20,000 square feet of, of outdoor space that we've kind of defined in different pockets. And you've got a couple of them are Wi-Fi activated with outlets everywhere and desk and shade. And it's a, you know, it's a working area. We've got a more collaborative area that's right off the belt line. Then we've got kind of more quiet zones where there's no, there's no Wi-Fi and there's no outlets. And it's kind of encouraged to be more quiet space. And um, we used an architect from the West Coast. And I think they always do things two to three years they're doing stuff before we find out about it and they've had some real success with you know just creating these different types of outdoor zones and, and being thoughtful about it not just hey here's 5,000 square feet with some benches I mean they're, they're real intent way more intentional than we would have been so it's been eye-opening to kind of hear them get into the weeds on that great question Chris um, this has been awesome thank you all for coming thank you to our panelists let's give it up for them <laughs>